Thank you for the message we had this morning that we can just apply it to our everyday lives and give our Lord all the praise for our pastor Tom. As we take this offering, we just meet the needs of our church. We ask this for your name. Amen. Well, let's, let's turn to 631, please, in our hymnal. I know who I have believed, and we're just going to sing the first and last verse for our evening special. 631. Let's give you a break and have you stand up and then sit. I know.
Thank you, ladies. That's uh, always a treat for us when you uh, play, uh, and we know that you put a lot into that, even by way of practice, and again, we're most appreciative to that joyful, I, I guess it's entitled Old to Joy, but joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And all of God's people said to that, we've come to worship God tonight, right? We've come to worship God tonight? Yes. yes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with joy we've entered into these gates. We love being with your people and we love being with you. And we have biblical warrant for that in a very special way where two or three are gathered together in your name. You're there in the midst. Special blessing, special presence of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And to think that we're speaking of the coming one, and that James, uh, in our study of his epistle, is driving home. And uh, we, we trust deeply into our hearts the reality uh, of Christ's coming. And oh, that you would help us. This is part of James' uh, point and purpose in his writing. And we find it in uh, many of the other epistles in the New Testament that we would more and more be living our lives with a view to the coming Christ. And so, Lord, use your word in our hearts, and uh, may, may we once again be transformed in practical ways by your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Our study in James continues. I have good news for you. Christ is coming. I have encouraging news for you, especially those of you that are facing the various trials and temptations and troubles and tribulations of life, that Christ is coming. I have a most challenging message for you, and that is Christ is coming. It will be our day of accountability. We've often said, and we've had opportunity to pursue this theme really for an extended period of time. Uh, and we have said on a number of occasions that whatever we want to be doing for the Lord Jesus Christ, we better be doing it now. Whatever we want to be true, whatever we want to be true in, in our hearts and lives in that day, uh, better be true tonight because he's poised and ready to return. Uh, we're working our way through a section in chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, where James discourses the future but imminent return of Christ. Take a look, James, chapter 5, verses 7 through 11, I read. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against uh, another, brethren, lest ye be condemned or judged. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Uh, take a look at verse 8. I am rereading. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. I really want to pick up with the word heart. You see it there, James writes, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. You, you actually are familiar with the Greek word here. Again, you know a lot more Greek than what you give yourself credit for. It's a Greek word, cardia. You can hear our English word cardio and cardiology and cardiologist uh, in it. The word sometimes in Scripture actually speaks of that um, physical organ that hopefully is and will continue to pump and beat in your chest uh, tonight, uh, but 
most often the term is not reflecting on the physical organ that's in your chest and pumping, but rather it's speaking of our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, and in summary, our minds. By the way, that's the greater issue. I'm not belittling the physical aspects of life and living. Uh, We wouldn't be here if that wasn't in function. But please, folks, there are greater issues. And uh, the greater issue here in regard to James and his theme is our minds, our intellects, our emotions, our thoughts, our wills, our feelings. And again, that's when Scripture speaks of our hearts, that is uh, more than likely the case. The emphasis, it's certainly the case in familiar Proverbs 4.23, you recall, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And Proverbs 23.7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And of course, you're very familiar with the greatest of all commandments, and it runs Bible-wide, but I like Christ's rendering in Matthew 22, 37, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. Uh, Listen, uh, uh, this is a neat observation that would warrant further study, but a case can be made for the distinction of those terms, heart, mind, and soul, but a case can also be made for the similarity of those terms. An emphasis on our minds, our hearts. It's where it all starts. Uh, We've already cited scripture. Scripture, you're certainly familiar with the saying, attitude determines what class? Attitude determines action. You guys, would you put your hand right here on your chest, make sure that thing is pumping. (laughs) Attitude determines action. No wonder there's a battle over our minds. No wonder in our study on Sunday morning in Genesis chapter 3 that it's really coming down to what's happening in Eve's and subsequently Adam's mind. No wonder we see the great adversary there functioning in Genesis 3 and that it's really a battle over Eve's mind. And of course we know who wins, at least temporarily, that that battle. So whoever or whatever controls our minds really controls our whole being certainly controls our bodies, certainly controls our actions. In one corner is the adversary. He's blinding our minds. And in the other corner is the Savior, and he's enlightening and renewing our minds. Oh, folks, how we ought to be on a daily basis allowing the Savior to renew our minds, and I don't know how that he would do that apart from our engaging him in, in and through the inscripturated word of God. Listen, every overt sin, I'm not telling you anything new, every overt sin begins with a thought. And another very familiar saying that apparently none of you have heard of, <laughs> I, I'm teasing, so a thought reap a deed, so a deed, reap a habit, so a habit, reap a character. You guys aren't going to go with me on this one, are you? Let's start again. So, so a thought, reap a deed, so a deed, reap a habit, so a habit, reap a character, and so a, a character, and reap a destiny. But what did we begin with? A thought. It is that powerful and that Significant. By the way, this is where the world's media comes in to play. I, I don't know if you have noted this of late. It is a startling, simple observation. 
Do you know what media is short for? You guys are really on your toes tonight, aren't you? <laughs> no, this one's a little bit harder. L listen to this. This, th this is very significant. Because I'm talking about the media that is an onslaught in our lives. And the thing that's interesting about the media, and listen, I, you know, I'm not going to you know, uh, condemn you for having a TV. I have a TV. I'm uh, not uh, you know, uh, looking to be condemnatory at all in regard to this. But I, I sure, because of my love and because of your love for the Lord, I sure want to embrace any and all challenges. Boy, we need, to be ch we need to continue to be challenged in regard to media. To think that we pay, I mean, we pay big bucks for this. It's an onslaught. You would say, when you talk about something that's an onslaught, you'd say, man, that's a, that, that must be a negative thing. Well, hey, I, we're, we're, we're dishing out all kinds of big bucks for that media stuff. And, and God is offering us, uh, again tonight, a, a word of caution. Media is short for medium. A medium, i.e. a channel through which something flows. Boy, we just need to allow God to set the record straight once in a while. The, the writer that we're reading, the director, the producer that we're watching, the author whose book we're working through the, the, these folk are channeling directly their thought into your heart and mind. That's the purpose of it. It's actually what media means. And here we are. We're paying big bucks. We're saying, I got to have this stuff. And we need to recognize again that often, not always, but often, our adversary is behind the thing. Boy, you and I, we need to be on our spiritual toes in regard to the media because it is a medium where the person is taking his thought and placing it directly in your heart and mind. So let's be careful. One other thing here about the word heart, cardiac, and cardiologist. I, I love this. A, a title for God that I... I'm sorry. A, a title for God that I didn't have. Initially, there is only one true cardiologist. And it's not your doctor and it's not you and it certainly is not me in fact from a biblical standpoint we know from God that we can't even know our own hearts Jeremiah 17 9 let alone someone else's heart let me show you a neat word and truth. You're keeping your finger here. We come right back, but we're turning to Acts chapter 1. This is so neat. Acts chapter 1, verse 24. Forgive me, you know, the context warrants much comment, but I'll, I'll succinctly say to you that here is Matthias and He's about to replace Judas, and you know the story uh, behind that. Um, verse 24, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, and here it is, which knows the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. See that phrase, this is kind of neat, we often observe this. The phrase, which knowest the hearts, is a single word in the original language, cardionastes. 
here's a title for God that I did not have a good handle on. The truth I did, I have missed the title. And I'll never be the same. Your God is the heart knower. Your God is the heart knower. Boy, it will absolutely transform our lives to be in tune practically with the truth that God absolutely knows our hearts. And I thought about that and recognize that it does at least two things for us. One, it certainly encourages our hearts. I mean, to know that God knows our hearts, to know that God knows what's going on, both uh, around us and in us, to know that God knows our hearts it certainly is, it is an encouraging thing. It certainly strengthens our resolve to live godly, to know that God knows our hearts, or to use James' words here, it really helps us to establish our hearts, which is the command that we have here, to establish our hearts in righteousness, if you will. But it does something else, too. It invariably results in a clean heart. Not only encourages our hearts, but it invariably results in a clean heart. That's why, and how often have we cited this? Again, oh, for a buck for each time that we've cited this of late. It's often the resolve of David. And we get to the end of Psalm 139. It's nothing but worship to the great God and his intimate and personal and sovereign involvement in our lives. And, you know, again, David's words, they just... You know, God knows our sitting down and our rising upright. It's, it's just, a, oh, it just absolutely warms uh, the heart. But interwoven that, in, interwoven through that is a significant challenge that God knows my heart. And the only legitimate resolve on our part in regard to that is search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there might be any wicked way in me. And I guess that's the bottom line. If we worship and serve the heart knower, that's actually his name, his title, then we're going to be very, very concerned about our hearts, what's in our hearts, the condition of our hearts. And all that we'd be as concerned for our spiritual heart as we are our physical. And guess what the motivation for all of this is? That we would have a clean and pure heart. The coming Christ. Take a look at the second half of uh, verse 8. Uh, i got to get back with you. I I'm telling you folks, I, I love my Bible. It's falling apart. Um... And uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you how difficult that is for me when, um, when I tear a part of a page out or, or I um, drop my Bible. Verse 8, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Uh, when Christ comes, note this, first of all, when Christ comes, he will be dealing with our hearts. He'll not, be, he'll not show up and give us like a physical exam. It'll be spiritual through and through, and the biggest thing for him, this is significant. The biggest thing for him will be our hearts. It doesn't matter where you turn, you find that kind of emphasis everywhere. I, I have cited this verse with you of late too, but I want you to see it, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. So once again, you're keeping your finger here in James 5. We're coming right back. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Notice the emphasis on our hearts. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time, 
until the Lord come, there's that coming Christ who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. When he shows up and he's poised and ready to return, he will be examining our hearts. By the way, that's the dynamic of the judgment seat of Christ, right? And we've noted that uh, together in the past. Because the initial reading of 1 Corinthians 3, which is one of the classic texts dealing with the, the judgment seat of Christ, which pertains to the saints, not the sinners, to the Christian, not the unsaved, uh, you know, a cursory reading of 1 Corinthians 3, you would kind of shake your head and say, well, you know, why in the world would our works be examined? I mean, they're either good or bad, and I remember quipping with you uh, when we studied through that text in the past that, um, y you know, I mean, we wouldn't be so foolish as to be thinking that we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and wait for um, one of our sinful acts to, to, and wait and see if it's going to pass the test of fire. It certainly isn't sinful acts that God, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be evaluating. So if he's not evaluating the sinful works in our lives, then what works is, are, is he evaluating? And it, it is the works that we think were good. He puts those works to the test. And what is the determining factor? the condition of your heart, your motive. The work has got to be good. It wouldn't even be brought up at the judgment seat of Christ. But whether or not it passed the test of fire relates to the condition of your heart. Was your motive proper? And so there is a strong and powerful emphasis on our hearts, and James is hitting that here. So whenever God speaks of the coming Christ, and whenever the Spirit of God prompts us to think of the coming Christ, which ought to be on a daily basis, it, it, it ought to be a time for a heart check for us. Is my heart right? I mean, join me tonight in asking these questions as you sit there and as I stand. Are our hearts right? God, is my heart right tonight? As I sit here tonight, is my heart right? As I sit here tonight, is my heart clean? As I sit here tonight, has my heart been established in righteousness? As I stand here tonight, is my heart upright? Are our hearts pure? Are you and I sporting an undivided heart? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Am I sporting an undivided heart tonight? And, and then uh, this wonderful truth. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. We have a good translation here. The Greek word behind the phrase draweth nigh it means to make near, to come near, to, uh, to approach. Uh, I've shared with you lately, and um, well, I think it goes all the way back to a men's encouragement conference, and then we probably visited the truth again. Um, during uh, the Friends of Israel Prophecy co Conference that we had the privilege of housing. The dramatic thing here in this phrase, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, the verb is that the verb is in the perfect tense. The perfect tense speaks of past completed action with abiding result. I've often shared with you, and I welcome every top opportunity, that's the kind of salvation that you have, for instance. In Ephesians 2.8 it says, For by grace are ye what class? saved. The, the, the phrase is in the perfect tense, which means that you have a perfect salvation. It means that the Lord Jesus Christ saved you sometime in the past, and we know when that was. It's when you recognize your sin and turn from your sin and embrace the one and only Savior. You were saved in the past, but it's a perfect salvation. It's past completed action. You were saved all the way through. You were saved completely but it continues to be the condition. Past action with abiding results. So we have a perfect salvation. And here James is using that perfect tense verb in expressing to us that the coming of the Lord draws nigh. 
i.e. that it had already at the time of James writing drawn near, the coming of the Lord had already drawn near as James writes this epistle. And that coming of the Lord having drawn near continues to be exactly the situation that God's people are facing presently, past completed action with abiding results. James is testifying that the coming of the Lord has already drawn near and continues to be near. These are the words of imminency. The fact that Christ could return at any time, the practical reality that there is nothing standing between us and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what I like. Uh, here, here's what I like that James goes on to do. James not only speaks of imminency, but then he leaves us with a picture, and that's what I'll be leaving you with tonight. He illustrates it. God often does that, and we're glad. Take a look at verse 9b. We're going to jump down a little bit um, and then have to backtrack uh, next week, the Lord willing. But um, t- take a look at verse 9b, uh, James chapter 5. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Again, the perfect tense. I'm rereading the end of verse 8. It says, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh, perfect tense. And then this at the end of verse 9. Behold, the judge stands, perfect tense, before the door. The picture is that the Lord Jesus Christ is standing before the door. He's already there. I Forgive me for the simplicity of the illustration, but I, I think if we could pretend that this is the door that he's standing at, I don't know that we should even shut it. But I think that we, let me step this off. I, I think we probably live our lives over here. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a picture that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, you have biblical warrant for it. I love Hebrews 1 and verse 3. After he purged your sins and mine, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I think this is the picture that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through and through a legitimate picture. But it's not the only one. We picture him seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We rejoice. We rejoice over the picture. Our hearts and minds go to another Uh, text in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 where because he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God he's in the position to ever make intercession for God's people we have biblical warrant for the picture and we rejoice over and worship him for this picture but it's not the only one I think some of God's people are right here And it's the only picture that we have of God. It's the only picture that we have of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think some of God's people do a little bit better. They might be right here, but Christ is still seated. And some do better yet, but Christ is still sitting. You know, the implication both here and here and here is that we got a lot of time because he's still sitting. Some of God's people do better and some better yet. And some almost really good. But none of this is the picture that James gives us. James gives us this picture right here. This is the picture that James gives us. No longer seated. 
He's standing. He's no longer back over there. He's right here, ready to walk through the door. Here's James' point. He says to us, listen, if you and I will live our lives right here with this picture, then you can be assured that you and I will be living the lives that not only please the Lord Jesus Christ, but a life that paves a way for us to not be ashamed before him at his coming. Let's embrace all of the pictures. He is indeed seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And he is, among other things, keeping us saved. But there's another picture of Christ. And it's right here. Listen, I say again, whatever you want to be doing when Christ comes, you better be doing it now. Whatever condition of heart you desire to be sporting when Christ comes, you better know that it's the heart that you have presently. So listen, let's re-embrace the practical reality of the coming Christ, knowing that that will produce in us a sense of godliness that the Apostle John familiarly speaks of in his epistle. More to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We love your word. We love the pictures that it paints for us. Uh, have noted with your precious people tonight that we have a number of pictures of Christ, and each one is so very special and precious and important. You know, we could speak at great length and actually have in the past of the Lord Jesus Christ purging us from our sin because of and through his work on Calvary's cross and then sitting down as an indication that the price had been paid in full. We rejoice so much over that that we often sing of it and rightfully so. And we revel in the reality that the Lord Jesus Christ in that position is ever making intercession for us. And in Tommy Teal language, he's, he's practically keeping us saved, which is, again, an exciting prospect. But I'm afraid, I think James is afraid that we have so focused with singularity on that one picture that we are missing another and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. James says, behold, take a look at this. James says he is standing before at the door. And God, I pray that you would help us to live our lives right there with that picture. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone that has his hope of his appearing purifies himself even as he is pure. The apostle reminds us. And so the song has already been alluded to through the Psalm 139. Let's stand and turn to 425, singing the first verse. Very thought provoking, searching song. 425, verse 1. Search me, O God.